Um, I was asked to speak about conservation planning and to put it in a global context and to bring you up to speed where the world is going in this context and how we're doing. So that's what I'm going to try and do. Now, in the program, I think it says something about the most important questions for conservation planning 2014. That was my title. But I thought that was a bit arrogant because how would I know what the most important questions are without consulting with my stakeholders? So I've changed it to some important questions. And the one that you see up there is not one of them, but I thought I'd just see who's awake. And if you don't giggle, it means you're not reading the text. Okay. <laughs> So that would be the equivalent of possibly me and my husband sitting on the couch in the evening watching telly. Those are the kinds of things that would happen. <laughs> All right, so the, um, the, the work I'm going to present today is based on a workshop that was held in May in Portugal to which I was invited as, you know, they always need to invite someone from South Africa. So this year I cracked the nod. Other years other people do, this year it was me. Anyway, so there you go. And we held it at a monastery in Arabida, or however you pronounce it, and it was absolutely fantastic. I would like to acknowledge the other people who were there, because what I'm presenting today is their combined intellectual capital. It is by no means mine, and mine alone. Okay, so what is the global context? Really the context for that meeting was opportunities provided by international policy and one of them is this IPBES, which is the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. These things are starting to become more important as are green economies. So the UNEP has a document out on green economies. And there's also, of course, the Convention on Biodiversity, which South Africa is signatory to, and so many other countries. And there's the UNRED program, which has gone up to two plus now, I think. And these all provide opportunities for funding and for work and for thinking in the direction of spatial assessments and spatial decision making, which is basically what conservation planning is. So that's the international context. But I'd like to bring it down to earth, as it were, and look at the real world. So conservation planning in the real world, what does it actually mean? This is what's happening in the real world. So top right hand side, that's our ecological footprint. You can see it's on an unsustainable path. We all know that. That's not news. The bottom left graph is extremely complex, but really all you need to know is that the line that's going down is a natural capital thing. It's forests. And all the lines that are going up is agriculture and population, et cetera, et cetera. So what is actually happening is those lines crash in the middle. So the demand for other things other than biodiversity, the, the demand for extractive things are overtaking the supply chain. And that's where we need to do smart conservation planning. Okay, this is, I believe, where we are at the moment. This is the boats in which we are rowing or sailing or not sailing as it were. Okay, and we are there because of this fallacious neoclassical economic model that the world currently ascribes to. So today's global economy does not value natural resources, assumes that they are limitless, waste is just a nuisance, and we have to have a growth economy. You hear it every day on the radio, we have a growth economy. Now, actually in the real world, everything's connected to everything. Everything's got to go somewhere and there are no free lunches. So the steady state economy is where conservation planners and biologists and biodiversity people would like us to go. But that boat is also not doing particularly well. And a steady state economy is relatively stable. It has stable populations, it has stable consumption, stays below carrying capacity, and it has advantages for lifestyle and morals. But we're not there. And the reason that we're not there is because there are three things that we as humans find very hard to do. So Herman Daly told us that we find it hard to share, we find it hard to control our population growth, and we find it very hard to reduce consumption. Now, why is this? If we look into anthropological evolutionary reasons for the, well, the evolution of human behavior, in the Pleistocene, we lived in small groups. That's the key. And most of our behaviors, we believe, evolved around food, possibly mates, resources, most, well, natural resources, um, shelter. The small groups made this all work, and the reason is because they cooperated. And if somebody wanted to cheat in the system, you knew who they were, and I don't think they would last particularly long. <laughs> and um, so you could measure your trade-offs, because in a small group, you've got the crazy maker, 
you leave them out for the wolves and that's probably the end of them. So the system worked, but now, in today's world, conservation actually has become about managing people. We don't manage our fish, our biodiversity, our environments very well, but we may be able to manage what we do to them. So this is where I'm going, it's about actions. And people will always have multiple conflicting objectives, and people love to cheat. And because we no longer live in small groups, we can't identify the cheaters, we can't really punish them too easily, and the trade-offs become quite hard to measure. So, if we think about the real world, we're actually managing conflicting objectives every single day. And that's what conservation planning is about. It's not about prioritizing places, it's about prioritizing what we do to and in those places. So how do we measure these trade-offs? Okay, so in the Pleistocene, we got quite good at making tools, and we're still good at making tools, but we're not good at working out the future. Had we been good at working out the future, that graph would not have evolved. Okay, so my personal beef at the moment, you know, everybody has to have a sort of a, a story that, they, that they're trying to sell in a particular phase of their life, and my current story is that conservation planning needs to measure the trade-off between production to keep this big system going and conservation. So for example, let's bring it to something real. How can we maximize food production and biodiversity gains at the same time? And can we? And are they conflicting or can they, be, can they happen together synergetically as it were? And the answer is yes. And I'm going to give you three examples. One of them is here at home. The work for Richard Carling and Ant Mills at, at all. They have a desertification, carbon sequestration, and job creation project running in the subtropical thicket restoration project, where they take bits of land, and that's the um, thickety land on the, on the nice side, and then the overgrazed land on the not so nice side, and they plant speck worm, and then it looks like. Okay, and the financial overview for this, for this thicket program is blah, blah, blah. Story at the bottom. If you continue with goat farming, as the picture was doing on the right, you can be looking at 40 to 100 rand per hectare per year. With the thicket story, you're looking at 400 plus per year. So there you are maximizing biodiversity and an ecosystem service. And that's kind of where I think we need to be going. Another example that is not local, it's a global example, is um, this particular paper published recently in Bioscience. And what it basically says is if you want to do conservation for mammals globally, and I mean, I know these are not particularly useful, you know, for cazid and wildlife necessarily. However, theoretically, if you want to conserve mammals globally, you need to have a global implementation of your plan. So if each country does their own thing, it doesn't actually add up to a, a good result. It adds up to a very inefficient result. And if you, if you exclude agriculture from your system, you're going to lose on the agriculture side and the biodiversity side. If you bring agriculture into the system, you can have a win-win for agriculture and for mammal conservation. And so the winner is the global plan. Um, and if you look at the regional and the national plans, you can see a lot of edge effects along the edges of countries. And that's what happens when you plan at a country level. It's basically inefficient. I know from a governance point it's not always possible, but that is just the theory behind this, where you can win for both biodiversity and, and um, something like agriculture. Fisheries and MPA is my personal favorite. We are also in what I call the race for fish versus the race for space. And if we look at an example of uh, maximum economic and maximum sustainable yield, what that graph is actually telling you is that if you are measuring your effort and what it costs you to go fishing, the maximum economic yield is actually to the left of the maximum sustainable yield, which means that you get a more efficient fishery financially and for the fish, if you fish to the left. In other words, go for maximum economic yield and not maximum sustainable yield. And if you look at the two, if you compare the two, traditional fisheries management has an MSY as a goal, the sustainable yield. But the economist says, no, 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 let's go for economic yield where your catch rate is lower, your profits per fish are higher, your effort is lower and your fish stock is higher and it's a win-win for big business and for the fish. A model like that, unfortunately, does not work in a country where, like South Africa, because of the whole issue around access to fisheries and poverty alleviation. Okay, so to get back to what I'm supposed to be talking about today, which is what, what are the conclusions about where we need to go with, with conservation planning, I'm going to take you through the six or so, and there were many, challenges that emerged from the workshop. Okay, so the first one is 
We've got to learn to engage with our stakeholders better and we need to collaborate better across governance systems and decision-making systems. So we need to avoid the standoff, which has been biodiversity versus the rest of the world, and we need to achieve something more akin to that. This is not something any, any of us are trained to do. We're not good at it. And we also don't speak the right language to our stakeholders. So these are the types of words we need to use. I have no clue what any of them mean. I'm kidding. I sort of know. But that's where we need to go if we want to win the war. And we don't go there because we're not trained and we don't like it. And people who do work in those fields we find very nerdy and we need to avoid them. But that's not going to win us any points. Now, I don't like to put slides up with lots of text on them. But I've done this because I just wanted you to know that we have thought about this. There are issues that we are thinking about. And if we just want to pick a couple of cherries, and I think Matthew Roger would agree with me, landscapes are multifunctional. And we need to involve these multi-stakeholders as much as we hate doing it. I mean, we do, let's face it. Um, we need to enhance our collaboration from local to provincial to national to global. We don't do that very well. KZ and Wildlife, by the way, is doing that very well in their marine program, the Sea Plan Project. There's some examples there. Um, and then this business about social assessments. We all do biodiversity assessments till they come out of our ears, but we don't do social assessments. We don't understand the governance. We don't understand how things work. We don't speak those right funny languages. And we need to be able to do that. Okay, so I'm going to be giving an example for each of the points from UMPA, the Offshore Marine Protected Area Project, which a lot of people here were involved in, led by Kerry Sink from Sanby. And this project is one of South Africa's firsts in engaging with a lot of stakeholders over a lot of different sectors. So there's oil and gas, there's mining, there's um, demersal trawling, there's long lining, there's purse sailing, there's biodiversity sector, etc, etc. All of those sectors came together and informed the UMPA process, which is why it's had some successes, which I think Gina's going to be talking about after me. Okay, so the second challenge is defining what the actions are, and there was a lot of attention paid to this. What are we actually going to do? Not where are we going to do something, but what are we actually going to do? And Hugh Pussingham likes to say, you can't prioritize places, but you can prioritize actions. So we need to move from saying, where are we going to go do something, to saying, where are we going to do what, and when are we going to do it, and why are we doing it? And each of those can be quantitative, and we need to be able to measure them. So mostly, we like to do single action conservation planning. We are going to make a nature reserve. Okay? And that's a little bit old-fashioned, and we need to move on. So what are we going to do in our nature reserve? Okay, we have to work that out. And we must work out, is a nature reserve the right thing? Are we going to do an MPA or fisheries management or both or what, what, what? And we need to understand what is the response to that thing that we did. So once we've made a reserve, yes, we do some management in the reserve, etc. But we need to be able to do modeling and predicting how much life is going to be better once we've done this action. We're not good at that. However, in, in UMPA, we did try lots of different actions for different reasons. So we sort of started to think about the top three pictures, which are, of course, exquisitely easy to read, tell you about protecting biodiversity pattern, threatened species, being thick stuff, pelagic stuff. The middle three pictures tell you about ecosystem services. We're going to reduce bycatch. Um, no, no, sorry, sorry. These are the um, where, where the things are breeding, those places. Yes, so if you want to keep the fish breeding nicely, then you're going to go and look after those places. And then the bottom ones are bycatch reduction. So that's a management thing. Different actions for different reasons in different places. We're starting to move to multi-action planning. Okay, number three, complexity and technical challenges. Okay, a lot of us live in the technical challenges world. I've lived there for a while. I quite enjoy it. It's like, are we going to use Marxan or Marzone or Zonation? You know, those are fun things. You can get your head around those things. But the only part of the story and the complexity of where we are going now with this multi-objective decision-making is very scary to biologists. And it's not so scary to the technical people. They love doing more programs to do more things. So I think the computational challenges will be solved relatively soon, but the ecological and the social challenges are still there. We've got dynamic processes, not static patterns. We've got non-linearities and random stuff and stochasticity, and that's how ecology works, and we're not really good at working through that. So there's a couple of things we can do soon. So let's pick one. We can measure the biodiversity benefits from connectivity that we could do. 
But, and the things we've already done and thought we've done is trying to address, for example, the risk of climate change. And I think we spend a lot of time on climate change and actually we need to look at what we call stoppable and unstoppable threats. What can we stop, example trawling, versus what can't we stop, for example, acidification of ocean water. We can slow it down, but those are kind of things that are overtaking us and we need to learn to deal with them. Let's focus on the stuff we can really get a handle on. So what the IUCN has done with their threatened species is they've looked at different sectors and they've said, what causes a species to go onto the threatened list? Which one of those sectors? And at the moment, when I say ongoing, that means at the moment, it's agriculture that is causing most species to be call, called to go into one of those threatened categories. And then the sort of, I've, I've just ranked it so that it goes from down to up. But then if we look into the future, the predictions of the IUCN into the future, they're looking at water means water management, so damming, water abstraction, those types of things. That's going to become the big one, with energy mining being quite high and agriculture not being the overriding one. And the reason for that, I think, is because agriculture is kind of maxed out. So where we can agriculturalize, we have. But there's a lot of places we haven't mined and we haven't dammed and we're going there, and I think those are why those ones are coming up. So if you want to engage with stakeholders and sectors, that graph can help you to understand where you need to go. So what did we do in OMPA? Well, we identified many stakeholders in different parts of the offshore environment, so demersal trawling, inshore trawling, blah, 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 blah. We set different targets for each of those sectors, and we had different cost metrics for each of those sectors. So we were starting to get there, but in a baby way. I think mathematicians would have laughed at us, but we really did try. Well, Kerry, I can't say we, Kerry. Um, so there's 27 of the costs of the threats to biodiversity in the open ocean that, that we felt needed to be mapped. So, I mean, turn that into one cost metric for your marks and analysis. It's just a little bit silly, really. So for an inshore trawl, an example that's a personal problem that I had was working with Colin on trying to reduce bycatch in the inshore trawl fishery and also reduce the catching of small fish, small hag. And it was like a, a sort of a double double objective thing and none of the software available did it so Colin had to write the software to do this and when I went to the meeting in Portugal I said to them please can you make us tools that allow us to measure the impact of displaced fishing effort because that was the issue if we close this section to the trawl fishery they've bought the boats they've got the fuel they need to fish where they're going to go they're just going to double up next door and at the moment our conservation planning software can't handle that unless we integrate it with some other form of modeling which is what I'm a big fan of so I like to have big teams a conservation planner a mathematical modeler a statistician that's how I like to work I still haven't got it right Okay, so data. We need anybody here who works with data will understand that your data needs to be of a high quality, otherwise you might as well go home and do something else. So if you speak to your um, EU politicians or your researchers, you're going to get a very same question, two very different answers. So where does the truth lie? There are many data gaps. We have got a lot of data on a lot of things, but there are many gaps. And the biggest gaps are actually in the socio-economic world, socio-political world. And Hugh Possingham likes to talk about a crankiness map, which is, if I do this action in this place, who's going to get the most cranky? And he also refers to it as, um, am I allowed to swear? Can I say a swear word? Pissing off stakeholders. <laughs> that's, what, that's what Hugh says, I'm just quoting, it's not me saying that. Um, and that's what it's about. It's about trading off and working out who's going to win and who's going to lose and what they're going to win and how much they're going to lose, etc. before you can make that decision. Um, ecosystem service maps, that's a personal problem I've had too, is um, we understand this ecosystem functions in a dynamic way. How do, we, how do we map those? In South Africa, we've done a very good job, I think, of mapping ecosystem services. Matthew's been involved in a lot of that work. And um, real-world cost data, this is another thing that keeps emerging. What does it actually cost to do conservation? What is the opportunity cost to the thing that we are displacing or stopping? And of course, many more. All right, so an example from UMPA. An ecosystem services map, that I like to call it ecosystem services map, so a fishery sustainability for small pelagics or for hake or for the demersal trawl. If you want to keep those fisheries going, these are the places that you need to conserve and this is how you need to conserve them. So using your data and, and looking for those kind of data and they, they're not collected in that way. So it took a lot of gymnastics to be able to get this kind of information out of the industry. Okay, number five, uncertainty. Now, I don't personally understand this graph, but I did a Google search on uncertainty and it kept coming up. So I think it's important. I think the cone of uncertainty 
is clearly important. And if there are any economists in the audience that can explain this, now's your chance. You see, see, no economists at a conservation planning. It's just silly. We need to get those other people in here. Okay, so basically what this says is at the beginning, don't make promises because you don't know what's going on. And later on, when you've collected data and you've thought about it and you've modeled and you've got your standard errors a bit closer and you've got the gray zones a bit blacker, then you can do stuff and you can tell people what to do. But the problem is we, we hunt and farm and fish and live and plan down where the skull is. And so we come up with a best case scenario for a conservation plan and then you get all the bad people come and they say, but that's not going to work and how do you know and what if you've got it wrong and all of that. And you're like, listen, we're just trying to do the best job with the best information that we have. And they say, yeah, but your uncertainty is so high, and you know, yada, yada. And so it goes on. And so we need to be able to know where we sit in the cone of uncertainty and we need to aim for the pointy bit on the right. I think that's really the message. And of course, if you speak to modelers, climate change modelers, they'll just laugh at you because every one of them every year comes up with completely new pictures. I mean, who, you know, what's really going on? Okay, so the uncertainty issues that are pulled out for discussion is um, what part of uncertainty is really important and what isn't? And I remember when I started working at the Fitzpatrick for Roy Siegfried, he said to me, don't bother with climate change. It's all about land use change right now, what's happening on the land right now. And yes, he's right, but he's also wrong. If you want to stop immediate threats, then yes, but we do need to look into the future. And I remember we're not good at that. We like to cheat and we're not good at working out the future. So we're a little bit hamstrung and so we need to be smart and we need to do all these models to assume and guess with best data what might happen and then we try and have to plan around that. But then policy comes in and blindsides you or throws you an opportunity ball and then all those lovely plans that you had are gone to naught because now you've got an opportunity to declare or do an action that you didn't have before and it's not one of your best actions for the future but hey, it's all we're going to get so let's go grab it. That happens all the time. And I don't know what the solution is to that. Um, I've already spoken about we need to reduce our uncertainty in our planning outcomes. I also don't know how you do that, but apparently we need to do this. And I do understand how we can try to measure uncertainties. So we need to be able to, you know, a, a lot of our models give us give us um, residuals that we can get an idea of how robust is this analysis and how good is this. When it comes to actions, doing things in places, it's a little bit more, it's more difficult. You know, other people have got the funding and the money to do R&D. We take the R&D and we apply it. So we are very good at applying techniques and technologies. We're good at asking the right questions. So based on these six things that I've shown you that are the, the challenges out there, I would like to, to urge the young and the older scientists to keep rocking. Take those on board, try and address them in whatever way you can. And let's keep rocking so that the next time I give this talk, it'll say 2015, we're still rocking. So that was just the message I wanted to leave you with. Thank you.